Hebrews 9, we left off uh, about, about verse 6. Um, let's look at verse number uh, 1. Let's just read down. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. We'll stop right there and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do uh, stop right now to acknowledge you publicly here uh, at our assembly. We thank you for these saints who are here. Tonight, we thank you for those who are listening to this by way of the blessing of technology. Father, we, we do appreciate the fact that we can be a part of what you're doing today in the dispensation of grace and, and, and just part of the ministry, Father. Um, we, we, we're, we're thankful for the Word of God. We're thankful for that Word being flesh, the Lord Jesus, who died for our sins on the cross. We thank you for the Word of God, the Scriptures, that we can study, rightly divided, and get the profit out of it, which you put into it. Father, we just thank you for each other. We thank you for this uh, evening. Well, we can come with those of my precious faith, faith to worship you. And we give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, so last time we started looking at this, uh, this issue of Christ being represented by that tabernacle that, that, that Moses was, was admonished by God to make after a certain pattern. All those things in that tabernacle back there in Exodus as they exited Egypt and came to the promised land. All those things pointed to the Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where we left out, look at off in verse 6. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. Get my time there. All right, there we go. Um, it says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Now, I didn't bring this out last time, but when we talk about the tabernacle that God told Moses to build in the, in the, in the wilderness, the one where the presence, you hear about the Shekinah glory of God, his presence uh, traveled with it, the nation of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. Uh, they were really tabernacles within tabernacles. A tabernacle is a, is a um, temporary tent or dwelling place. It's a tent, it was a dwelling place made of skins. In fact, our Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, if the earthly house of this tabernacle, our bodies are called a tabernacle. One of the feast days, in fact, the seventh feast or festival of Israel is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is God dwelling with them. It's a dwelling place. It's also called the Feast, feast of Booths. Um, you see that in the book of John. Uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, John says about Israel's Messiah. That's John 1.14. Well, that was a tabernacle of flesh that Jesus Christ had. Um, you remember when, when Peter and James and John was on the Mount of Transfiguration? You might remember that story. It's a famous story in Christianity in the Bible, from the Bible. Peter says, Lord, when he saw Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets, the two witnesses of the Lord Jesus, he says, how about we make a tabernacle for you, Lord, one for Elijah, one for Moses? Well, what that was was a type of the kingdom coming and that last feast representing God with them is the Feast of Tabernacles yet to come. Well, there was tabernacles within tabernacles. Look at verse 6, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest, and that's not the high priest, but the, the regular priest, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. So um, I, I did a, a crude drawing. By the way, uh, I wrote one. I drew one up at home this week, and I forgot to bring it. I'll bring it next next week. I, I just kind of drawing the, the tabernacle. It's kind of like a, a box, an ark, as it were, a box. And then there's the uh, there's a there's a another one inside, and there's the outer court, and then you go in, and there's the inner court, and where the inner court is, where the priest went in. Look at verse number six again. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Paul uses that term, Paul, our apostle, uses that same term, service of God, in Romans 9. Go with me to Romans chapter 9, since we're in Hebrews. Just go, yes. Oh, thank you. Let's see that. Romans chapter 9. Oh, for those who are listening, 
Thank you, Jim. Well, Jim has a picture of the tabernacle here. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so Ryan, we can get this on here. If you're watching the video, what you see is, and, and this is much better than what I can ever do, you even see the little temporary tents that the Israel, Israelis had in the wilderness surrounding it, and even how God had them um, surrounding the tabernacle. If, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the, it was in the, um, it looked like the cross from up top there. It looked like a cross. Interesting. But anyway, you see that? There's a tabernacle. There's that tent. And then there's a smaller tent in here. And within that smaller tent, so there's the outer court. You see the brazen altar right there. Excuse me. The brazen altar where they made the uh, uh, sacrifice. You also see this uh, basin of, of water. Thank you. You see this basin. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good, good, all right. So you hear, God, here's where they offered the sacrifice, right? Outside the camp, Same, similar to the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> who was sacrificed outside the camp. Then you, here's this, this issue of the cleansing, the, the place of, of the, what they call the, 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 where they kept the water or the cleansing purification waters. It's right outside. Then the priest, when here you see, they call it the candlestick. Today they call it manure of the Jews. You see that? You see the table of showbread and, and so forth and so on. Then there's a veil, okay? And then within that veil, once a year, the high priest went in, and that's where the Shekinah, there it is right there, the glory of God. Now, all this represents both the universe. You have the, the third heaven. There's that ice shield, Ryan and I were talking about God. When he made a firmament in the midst of the waters, he divided the waters from the waters. There's waters above the heavens where the, the planets and stuff. That's the third heaven. There's an ice shield, or a veil. There's where God lives. Then you have the area of the heavenly places, and then you have our atmosphere here on earth. There's a lot of symbolism there. Where did Jesus Christ's sacrifice take place? Down here on the earth, see? God left here, came here, offered the sacrifice. See that? It's a lot of symbolism, and then he took it back here, the, the high priest of Jesus. So, but it's also a picture, not just of the universe, but of the human body. Look here, you have the skin of flesh, you have your body, your, your, your physical body. Then you have this area of the soul, this area here, your inner man, which is also now your, your spirit where God dwells. So there's a lot of symbolism, thank you Jim, for that. But it was a tabernacle within a tabernacle, and so that's what he's talking about. Thank you, that was great. That was better than I could draw it, so that's, that's great. That's really we, we need a, we need a, like something long up maybe next time. Visual. There you go, visual. So that's what he means uh, when he says the first tabernacle. Look with me, that issue of the service of God. Go with me to Romans chapter number uh, 9. And look with me at verse number 4. Romans 9 verse 4. Krista, when you get a chance, uh, if Jadalyn wakes up, you give me a cup of water. It would be great. Thank you. Uh, Romans chapter 9 verse 4. Speaking of Israel, Israelites, start at verse 1. Paul was accused of not loving his nation. And we'll see this when we study Romans on Sunday. I say the truth in Christ, verse 1. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. I wrote down some stuff I'll bring next week about how the spirit is made up, the soul, and the body. Um, you have different parts. In, in the spirit, that there's your, 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 um, your connection with, with, with other spirits, particularly God. Um, that's where uh, the life of, of the man, the spirit gives life. But you actually have your conscience in there too with science and some other things. Intuition, these things make up that. Then in your soul, you have your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then in your body, that's your connection to the outer world, how you serve the Lord uh, or how it's worked out. Well, Paul had this inner witness that he loved the people of, 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 of God in time past, the Jews. Look at verse 2. That I have great heaviness, listen to the words he uses, heaviness, and continual sorrow in my heart. The only thing I can compare that to now that I have a child is that if, if my daughter, our daughter grew up and decided not to be a grace believer, that she didn't want to serve the Lord or care about the Lord. As a parent, that would give me great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I love her. But it would, it would hurt my heart if our daughter rejected Christ. And you, you all who are uh, parents or have other loved ones could understand that. Well, that's how Paul felt about his people, Israel. Verse 3, 
For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul himself was an Israeli, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. What that means is that the ones who God made the promises, and particularly the adoption of sons, the original concept of to become the sons of God was given to the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm for the, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers, Romans 15. Well, look, they get the adoption. Look at verse number 4. And the glory. Who were the people on earth that God chose to put his glory in? That tabernacle had the Shekinah glory of God. It was among the Jews, the Israelis. That was their calling. Verse number four. And the covenants. All the covenants of scripture were made with the G Jewish people. Beginning, when I say, say the covenants, there's the covenant of the Noahic covenant not to, not to uh, flood the earth again. That was all humanity. But I'm talking about the covenants of promise. These things here from Abraham on, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the law, the Davidic covenant, uh, the kingdom and, and, and the Palestinian covenant for the, for the land, all these different things fulfilled for the nation of Israel. How does God deal with you and me today? By pure grace, the dispensation of grace. And we're going to look at that later when we look at the difference between the New Covenant and New Testament, okay? Might even do that today. Well, look at verse 4. So to Israel pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenant, and the giving of the law. By the way, notice how Paul separates the law covenant from the rest of the covenants. Why? Because this was temporary. God separates the law. How Paul says it in Galatians is the law was added because of transgressions. The law was added. God already was dealing with Israel based upon his Abrahamic covenant. The law was added in Exodus chapter 20. Thank you, dear. Through so through Moses, that's right. But that one's temporary. Appreciate it. That one's temporary. And uh, oh, she woke up. Her father's loud voice, huh? <laughs> oh, that's refreshing. Thank you. So that one was temporary. Okay? That's why Paul separated. It is a covenant, but because it was temporary, he writes it like this. And the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So what I want you to see is that issue of the service of God, that, that's, that's the priesthood. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6. Israel was created by God to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What did he tell them in, in Exodus 19? If you obey my voice indeed, I, I will make you... Uh, oh, you got to look at it. You can go back there with me. I'll, I'll read it. Exodus 19. If you desire, I'll just read it real quick. Exodus 19. People of both people. Yes, for all the earth is mine. You know that nation. I'm slipping. My wife would say, "I know the women." Okay, Exodus 19, verse five. Start at verse four. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings. You know why the eagle represents the deity of Almighty God is because he. That's how he bared them, as an eagle bears her own young on her wings. To teach them as it were. Well, the book of John, one of the four faces of the cherub, there's four faces. I had the most interesting conversation with a 90 year old gentleman today. He knows that I teach the Bible, so he's asking about it. And he's talking about the, the new, he says, Have you heard about a new version called the story version? I said, Well, no. I said, Well, tell me about it. He says, Well, what they did is, they, make, they take all the these and the hows out. I, I couldn't get that much into it because I was about to drop them off. He says, but you know, they took the four Gospels and they made them one. I said, interesting. He says, compiled it. Made it a little easier. And I said, okay. He's like, what do you think about that? And I said, well, I, I, my personal preference is the King James Bible. I, if, I'll tell you more about it later. But I said, the four Gospels, the reason why God has four is because there are four different presentations of Israel's Messiah. I said, in the Old Testament, God says that this is how you'll know who the Messiah is. And among things, he says, behold your king. And so Matthew shows him as king. Okay? Servant. You have, behold my servant, the branch. And, it's, and, and Mark shows him as a servant. And, and, and. It's moving. He's working, right? No genealogy, just working. Matthew's genealogy has David, the king, and Abraham, right? 
Then you have Luke. Luke is where you see him at 12 years old. You see his prayer life more. You see his life with his mother. And Shows him as the man, magnificent man, right? Behold the man, the Old Testament says. And then obviously the last one is behold your God. Shows him as the word of Almighty God. John. That's John. And actually Luke's genealogy goes back to Adam, his humanity, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I said, and, and then I had to stop here because he was about to get out. And I, I, I would have to have a Bible class. There is a creature that's, that protects the glory of God. It's called a cherubim, okay? Lucifer was one. He has four faces, Ezekiel says, and it's the face of a, of a lion. Lion is the king of the jungle, represents Matthew. He has the face of an ox or a cherub, that's a, a cow, and that's the, 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 the servant, the beast of burden, that's Mark. He has a face of a man, that's Luke, and he has a face of an eagle, which represents God. The reason our country has an eagle is the majesty of Almighty God, and that's what the Bible uses. And that's how God describes himself to Israel. Look at verse 4, Exodus 19, verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will, now here's the covenant, if and then, watch this, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. See, it is a covenant, but it's a temporary one. Then, you see where it says, if, then? Yeah. That's the principle of the law. If you will, then I will. If you don't, then I won't. Right? If ye will obey my voice, verse 5, indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You see that? God is about to separate this one nation out of all the nations. And what he's going to use to do it is not just circumcision. There were other Abrahamic, uh, excuse me, uh, sons of Abraham amongst the Gentiles who were circumcised, Ishmael and sons of Keturah and so forth. But what separates Israel from everyone else is that law. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Psalm 147, 19 and 20. He has not done for, so for any nation... And as for his word, they have not known and praise you the Lord. The Gentiles have not the law, Paul says. So what made them, that middle wall partition has to do with that law and circumcision, but the law strengthening. Verse 6, Exodus 19, 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of what? Priests. Priest and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto now the children of Israel. You remember what Peter says? We'll see that when we get out to 1 Peter. He says, ye are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? What did John say in Revelation about Israel? And we shall be kings and priests, and we shall rank, rule and reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. That's not the body of Christ. That's Israel. What's the body of Christ doing? We're, we're, we're already serving the Father in the heavenly places. We're serving him in heavenly places. By the time that verse is fulfilled... In Revelation, when Israel and the Old Testament saints are ruling and reigning as kings and priests on this earth for the rest of the Gentile world, you and I have already started our reign in the heavens. Yeah. And what are we going to reign on? Over, the, over the heavenly kingdom. Go with me, if you will, on the great question. On the way back to Hebrews, stop by Colossians 1, if you will. Colossians. Yeah, the book of Colossians. Uh, Sister Dorothy's question was about what are we going to rule and reign over? Well, in the same way that Israel will rule and reign on the earth in positions of rank and authority within the earth. You have corresponding or similar positions of rank and authority in the heavenly places. God created the, the heavenly places, the planetary system and all those things, and he created rulership. Now, it's invisible to our eyes now, but that's what uh, God created. And, the, and Satan and his angels fell from many of those positions. I'll show you that. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 14. Start at verse 13. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness. So when you get saved, you're delivered from Satan's dark, prince of darkness kingdom. Now watch what he did. He and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now what's a kingdom? A king's domain, right? A king's dominion. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So God's kingdom... Has, has, has authority both in heaven and on earth. Thy will be done. 
That's right. That's what that's. Hey, you, you know when that think about think about when they pray that verse, this that, that prayer. It's called the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the disciples' prayer. The Lord taught them. Right. The true Lord's Prayer is John 17, if you want to read right. that. When they, when the little flock of Israel, that's what he calls them, Luke 12, when they pray that prayer in the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, that's a true prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because at that time, his will will be done in heaven. It's going to be... God is, is, is reclaiming the heavenly places, starting with that rapture, that judgment seat. The next thing the Lord's going to do for the body is hand us over to God the Father, okay? And there's going to be some reconciling. But here, look what he says. So you're going to go into the kingdom of his dear son, or you are there. We'll, we'll, we'll be up in that kingdom in a moment when he gets us, comes to get us. Verse 14, speaking of his son, in whom we have redemption, now don't leave out the through his blood. Uh, I told you about my conversation with uh this, this, this gentleman today, I guarantee you that Bible he's using takes out the blood because they're using a different text than what the King James. And in Colossians 1.14, these other texts take out the blood. See? And it's in this Bible. Is, is, is it in yours? In Colossians. Colossians 1.14, do they have blood in there? No. Now, now think about this, Dorothy. Why would it be that the part of the verse that they omit has to do with what brings the redemption, the blood of Jesus Christ? Isn't that interesting? Paul says in Romans 3 that we have a, a redemption through his blood. Through his blood, right. My King James in Colossians 1.14 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even through the sin. And so I ask people, I say, if your version takes out the blood, see, that's a subtle way of taking away Absolutely. from the cross. So, okay, let's keep going. Verse 15, who, speaking of Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now watch it. Here, here's why he's the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. I love this verse. That's right. That are, now, now watch this, that are in heaven and that are in earth. Then he goes on to give more understanding, visible and invisible. Obviously, the ones that are visible to us are the ones down here. They're invisible up there, but they're just as real. We just can't see them with our, with our human eye right now. Whether they be. Now, he's not going to go into the birds and the trees and the flowers and the bees, the things that we think about. He's going to go over to positions of authority. Verse 16, whether they be thrones. Now, what's, what's the purpose of thrones, uh, plural? Kingdom. That's right. Some rulership there. Some people who, 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 who reign as kings and priests, those things. Or dominions. These are other uh, uh, secondary uh, authorities in the heavenly places. Ruling authorities. Principalities. You see the word prince in there. Or powers. Rulers or authorities. That's right. Remember Paul says later in Ephesians, he says, or before in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The ruling authorities in that second heaven in particular is the issue. Well, that's what the body of Christ is going to rule over. Not the ones on earth. That's Israel. Kings and priests and ruling in the earth. The body of Christ was created, Dorothy, to take over the ones in the heavenly places. God's wisdom, see, all through the cross. Everybody's been trying to bring me down into the kingdom. Yeah, don't bring you down. Lift you up. I know. Stop trying to bring us down. I read it and down. I get excited about it and then they bring me down well, again. That, that's simply because they don't listen to Paul. They don't no. understand Paul's unique that, authority, ministry, message, apostleship. But when you learn the Apostle Paul's message, you're going to learn Ephesians is the book to learn about the heavenly places. Right. Okay, so that's what God's going to do. Go back with me okay. to Hebrews. Okay. So, Hebrews, though, the focus is the earth. And the reason why God, through the right of Hebrews, is focused on that earthly tabernacle is because at this moment, if I close the chart, if we're in prophecy again, if we're in prophecy again, the dispensation of grace is over, God's going to pick up in his prophetic program. That's where the book of Hebrews comes in. When will the book of, he book of Hebrews, uh, in essence, go into effect again? is after the rapture. That information will be what God is dealing with in the earth. It'd be right here. 
during this transition period and then the seven years of Daniel and then to the kingdom. Okay? I've never been told that. I've never been told that Hebrews was prophecy. Oh, it's have, prophecy, yes. I never have either. I well, that's, heard. yeah. Because if you don't rightly divide the word truth, you won't, you won't, you won't see that. And preachers true. and teachers who don't rightly divide, they will, they will never tell you that. Yeah. The light went on. <laughs> well, amen. Praise the Lord for that. Think about this. The Hebrews. Dorothy, you watch this. Jude also. Everything from Hebrews to Revelation. Prophecy in the future, particularly with Israel. Here, look at this. Look at, the, look at how God put that Bible together. Abram the Hebrew, now he's dealing with the physical seed of Abraham, the Hebrews. Yes, they're Israelis, but guess what? They're Hebrews first. That's their race from Father Abraham. That's their language. They then become a nation of people, Israel, after Jacob, the, the grandson of Abraham. They then become Jews, as it were, particularly from the, the religious system of the law of Moses, Jews. When God changes the program, now we come to Paul's ministry, look, look at the first book. God is saying, I'm not dealing with the Jews, I'm dealing with, or the, 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 my, the Hebrews, I'm dealing with the Romans. Who are those? The Gentiles. That continues on to the 13 letters of Paul, Romans to Philemon. This is our doctrine. When this dispensation of grace is over, so too is these, are, these epistles, they won't be in effect. That's not how God's dealing with the world. He's only dealing with the world during the dispensation of grace through Paul's epistles. When that's over, at the rapture, God will then call the Hebrew people back to himself. How does he do it? Book of Hebrews. Bam, right there. That's, Romans. that's fantastic. That's the wisdom of Almighty God. Well, then also right the book of Hebrews talks about the sacrifices well, sure. and yeah. all of that sure. because that's going to be during the tribulation. Oh, darn They're going to go back in the... Temple. You know how people go to Hebrews chapter 6 and chapter 10 and they say, well, it looks like you can lose your salvation, blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, right. that's because they're under the law. They don't have a surety in the book of Hebrews. Look at this uh, one. So. I wish you can see. <laughs> they don't have the assurity that we have under God's grace. That's right. In fact, that's why if you study in the book of Hebrews, it, it should make you appreciate God's grace even more. Absolutely. And that's, that's why when you don't rightly divide, you take away from the mystery and the grace. You don't appreciate grace as you should. You appreciate grace by rightly dividing the word. Divide it. Absolutely. There you go. I'm afraid. I like Dorothy. That's why a lot of people fall away from the Lord. Huh? That's why a lot of people fall away from the Lord. They don't realize they're under grace. Among other, well, That's a good point. By not understanding you're under grace and what that means, it's very easy to get discouraged and fall away. Sure, you, you sin once, and then another, that leads to another one, and then by the time, right. dang, I'm too bad to be, yeah. you know, I have any yeah. place in the God's The confusion is exactly. discouraging. That's exactly what I'm recording for Sunday on radio, because I, I use the verse where Paul says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, right. for you're not under law, you're under grace. I'm showing people that what's going to have strength in your sin life is the law, the performance. The law is a performance-based acceptance, right? It's religion, it's legalism. That thing will just pound you and destroy you. Absolutely. What you need to hear is God's grace, who he's made you, not based upon your performance, but who you are in Christ. Right. That's grace. Now, have... understanding that or learning that, that, that will energize your Christian life. It take does. Take the focus off of you, yeah. put it on him. Exactly. Then you go on to read Hebrews and James. and That's right. Then you come back down again. See? Well, well, you know what? You and I, if you understand, you and I in the dispensation of grace are not in those books. We can now learn them and appreciate them right. and not feel like that's talking to us. Right. So if we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice of sin, but a fearful looking for the wrath of Almighty God. Well, if you think that's you, that's scary. I know. Yeah, <laughs> it is. If you read Revelation and don't understand right division, it's a scary book. That's right. Because it's all about the wrath of God, okay? But now that we understand that's not for us, we're already going to be with our Father in heaven. This thing is out here for the people who reject Christ today in our dispensation. The people on the earth then will go through all that stuff. We're not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. That's Paul that's right. says. That's right. That's right. Wait, well, man. I like Dorothy. Yeah, sit right there. Okay. <laughs> here we go. No, I appreciate that because that's good feedback. The service of God. Look at uh, Hebrews 9, verse 6. So, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always 
into that first tabernacle. Jim, thank you for showing us that. So yes. you had the tent of skins, and then inside you had another tabernacle, and there's the outer court, there's the first tabernacle that the priests went and did that service, right? But they never went into the veil, that holiest of all. One priest, the high priest, went in one time a year, right? The Day of Atonement. There is a National Day of Atonement coming for the nation of Israel. Let me explain. Of the seven feast days, Leviticus 23, uh, Leviticus 23, Passover, there is his death. Unleavened bread, putting sin away, there's his burial. First fruits from the dead, there's his resurrection. Fifty days later, 40 days speaking to his apostles, then 10 days later, the day of Pentecost was fully come, right? Fully come. There's the fulfillment of Pentecost, Acts 2. Then there's this gap of months, and then you have, well, let's close. Now, we know what this gap is now, looking back. It's the dispensation of grace, but only God knew that. Israel doesn't know that, okay? So it was a kept secret. <laughs> but in their program, there's a little gap here, then the seventh week of Daniel. But then the next feast is the Feast of Trumpets, where when the Lord comes, he's going to regather his dispersed of all. They're going to be Jewish believers in every nation. Now, the focus of Revelation is the Middle East, but there are going to be Jews all over the, the, the world, believing Jews. And so what's going to happen is he's going to regather them to, to their kingdom. That's the Feast of Trumpets. Blow the trumpet, gather Israel. The next thing on the agenda is what is called the National Day of Atonement. That's the one represented when the high priest goes once a year into the holy place. That's going to be the dedication ceremony where the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed for those people in that, in that kingdom will be dedicated in the, in the temple on this earth, his temple. And then after all is taken care of, the Feast of Tabernacles, God with us, okay? What about the people that are left in, say, America and the other nations? They're going to be subject to the Jews. They're going to be subject to the Jews, okay. To you, the you, hear, you hear stuff today from Americans, the Jews run everything and we subject, we'll just wait to the kingdom. Right. <laughs> if you think, that, you know, they talk about Hollywood, how the Jews run everything, just wait to the kingdom. Now, I'm not saying they, those Jews will. They, many of them are lost, atheist Jews. But I'm saying Israel will rule over the entire nation. The People in America will one day be subject to, Jew, to Jew, Jews. The Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to destroy. The Antichrist. What, say that again? They'll have to bow to the Antichrist. Now, that's before the kingdom. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Okay, great question. The Antichrist. The person who's going to destroy the Antichrist is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, let me say it like this. But during those years, seven years, uh -huh. where, where are the people that are left here in Sacramento? In Sacramento. Or in, in Sacramento. Are they going to be under the Antichrist rule when Whoa. they take the mark of the beast or Will that just be for the Jews, or will it be for the people? Later? It's going to be, eventually, if the Lord allowed the Antichrist in Islam to, to, to go, what I think is, is to, 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 for its goal to subject the whole world, then eventually. But it, it takes time. Here, I'll give you an example. It's going to take 1,000 years, Dorothy, while the, I'm talking about the Lord Jesus is on this earth. Right. It's going to take 1,000 years for his word to make it around the world. So how much more the Antichrist? It starts in the Middle East yes. and works its way around. And that's only three and a half years. Right. So in three and a half years, the Antichrist, only his focus is, and just, just so you know, okay, watch this. When the Antichrist starts out in the beginning, right, mm -hmm. he's going to be the, the man of sin. He's going to be a human being. Okay? Yeah, but he's going to be deceiving. Yes. He's going to have the power of Satan right. working, but he's going to be a human being. He's going to die of a deadly wound in the midst of this week. He's going to die. By the hands of one of his so-called friends over there, they're going to kill him, okay? okay. His soul, that man, his soul is going to go to hell. His body's going to lie in state for three days. And then at the same time, something's going on in the heavens. Michael and his angels are fighting with the dragon and his angels. That's the same as Christ. Ah, yeah, he's the, he's the false and Christ. He's the false Christ. Bam, there you go. But you got to understand, he's going to rise from the dead. Yes. Now, I personally believe that when Judas died, it says, Peter says, he went to his own place. He didn't say hell, and he says his own place. Now, what I believe is this, what's going to happen is, 
The, Antichrist, the man who's that Antichrist, the, the man of sin, will die from that deadly wound. His soul's going to go to hell. Judas will come out that pit and, and reanimate his body. The spirit, that's, that's going to be the soul in that man's body. The spirit in that man's body is going to be Satan himself because yeah, he's kicked says, out. It says from Satan. Now, Judas and Satan is going to be in this man's body. The person who's going to destroy him, them, is the Lord Jesus. Plus Judas he is, and the Antichrist are both called the son of perdition. They're both, the only two men called the son of perdition, the book of John calls Judas that, and the book of 2 Thessalonians, Paul calls the Antichrist. They're one and the same. The but watch this. Here's the beautiful part about it. When the Lord does come and destroy the Antichrist, the, the son of perdition, Judas, Satan, and that humanity, he's going to do what David did. He's going to cut his head off. Cut his head off. Because what David did to Goliath, cut his head off. Goliath's a type of the Antichrist. David's a type of the Lord, the man of war. And what happens is, you know from Revelation, that one of the things the Antichrist is doing to believing Jews, or to Jews, period, there's, there's a mixed multitude. There's Jews and then there's believing Jews. He's cutting their heads off. He's beheading them. That's what Revelation says. That they, they say that there is a, a, a warehouse of guillotines. Oh no, that's the sword. Oh, oh no, well, well watch this. Do you know a religion in the Middle East who takes infidels, grabs them like this, don't go on, don't look on YouTube because you'll see this guy Daniel Pearl getting that. They grab this Jewish and they've done it to others, but they got a video of a guy of a Jewish man named Daniel Pearl. They grabbed him and they screamed Allah Akbar. They used a, a, a sword, or what's called a sword, so hands up. And it, was, it wasn't that sharp, it was kind of dull. Ooh. And they just, right there. And they recorded it, jihad. So there's a religion that hates Israel, yeah. who one of the ways they get rid of infidels yeah. is to cut their heads off. Yeah. Well, Revelation makes it clear that that Antichrist and his religion will cut heads, or they will behead people. Right. You right. will take the marker. Exactly. So. To answer Dorothy's question, eventually, okay, so will someone in Sacramento County, California have to take the mark of the beast? Right. If the Lord allowed that satanic policy evil to get all, and you know, that, that Antichrist religion, eventually, yes. But because, because the issue with Satan is not, Satan doesn't care about Sacramento County. He cares about the land of Israel. He, he cares about that. Jews. The Jews, right. He wants to destroy the Jewish people because God's people in prophecy. Right. Right. He wants God's land, right? So it will be concentrated on that. Bam, right there. Yeah. Now, if, if, if it worked its way over time, if God allowed, it would eventually get but over he here. he won't allow. No, he won't. Because the scripture says he does. Mm -hmm. You know what? To save the Jewish population, he's going to get over, he's going to come back. Yeah. So think about it. If it takes the Lord a thousand years to get his word around the earth, the Antichrist is only going to have a short time, three years. Right. So the focus is going to be the Middle East. Okay. Great question. These are great. All right. So they got the service of God, verse 6. That's Israel. Verse 7. But into the second, and that's the second tabernacle behind that veil, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Verse 8. Here's, here's what the Holy Ghost was showing you in, in that. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was, what's that next word? Not yet made manifest, whilst at the first tabernacle was yet standing. Okay. Why is that veil there? And why the prohibition only once a year, but don't come without blood? Because all that was in effect until Jesus comes to fulfill the type and shadow. What happened when the Lord Jesus Christ died? The veil, the veil in the temple rent into top to from bottom. top, top to, bottom. to bottom. That thing, I can't remember how tall it was. Twelve Somebody inches thick. Twelve feet. Uh, it twelve was, feet. Uh, it was very thick in the twelve. Cloth, twelve inches, I think. But it was very tall. It was. Yes. I can't remember by part. I have to uh, tell you next time. It, it was either twenty-six or some even say forty feet. It was very high. And the point of it being so high, a man couldn't rip that thing. God did. That thick, yeah. that thick exactly, and tall. So, and, and when, to say it was from the top down, saying that God did it. God did it. Okay? Thank you. And that's, and that's fine if you want. So the point, exactly. So what happens? 
Jesus shed blood. Now the way is made, right? right. But there's more. Wait, there's more, as, the, as the, they say on TV. <laughs> Ryan and I were talking about the third heaven. There is an ice veil. There, there's a veil, a firmament of water. Praise ye, ye waters, and ye waters above the firmament. All these things the song says. There is a veil separating the third heaven from humanity, from, from the second heaven and first heaven. The same way that veil is going to be taken away because of the blood of Christ, guess what's going to happen? In the kingdom, there won't be any barrier between heaven and earth. That veil, because of Christ and what he did, is going to be taken away. Notice that when um, the prophets of Israel looked up, when God opened, you ever heard him say the heavens opened? Mm -hmm. What happened to Stephen? He saw the heaven open and the Son of Man standing. Right. John sees the heaven open or Ezekiel sees the heaven open. Isaiah, what, what I'm saying is that once Christ came, he now, the potential is there. It's not going to happen to the kingdom, but now that veil, that, that veil that separates the third heaven from the rest of us down here, when we look up there, it's just dark. You can't see. Mm -hmm. Well, the glory of God's going to shine. Isn't that wonderful? There won't be any barriers. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Go ahead and mention if you want. Oh, can, so can I get that? To something, it says it went from being 15 feet wide by 15 oh, feet long 15. with a linen veil in the time of Moses to okay. 20 feet wide by 60 uh, feet long oh. four inches thick in the temple of Jesus' day. Oh, yeah. So that, that makes sense because um, obviously in Moses' day it was, a, it was a temporary little dwelling place and then Solomon's temple and then the rebuilt Herod temple you understand now it's more permanent right. the point is, for a man to just rip out yeah a man's not going to do it not, they can't do it that tells you that that was God and that's what was going on look at verse 8 the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest that's before Jesus died while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. So he's talking about those um, uh, gifts and sacrifices on the altar that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now, again, a conscience is, is, is an aspect of your spirit. Um, kind of the breakdown, you have a spirit where we worship God in the spirit. But that's kind of broken down that you have this intuition, you have the conscience, you have uh, your connection with the spirit world, God, the devil, whatever. Then your soul is your mind, will, and emotion. So part of that, part of your spirit is this. As they went and worshiped in that tabernacle, excuse me, the uh, holiest of all, the, the high priest. Remember I told you they put a, um, Jews had a custom of putting a rope around the guy and bells. They wanted to hear him do his thing, and yet if he died before Almighty God, they can pull him out. They got to pull his carcass out and bury it. And ordain a new high priest who's going to be really scared. And that is sure the conscience. They were going in there knowing that, you know how Paul says your conscience either convicting you or, or you know, uh, uh, accusing you, the guilty conscience. Can you imagine being a high priest and you did something wrong and you had to go and it was coming up on the Day of Atonement? And you're, 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 this is a solemn thing. This is not a joke. This is solemn. You're about to go in the presence of God with blood for yourself and the entire nation of Israel. And this is a holy place, man. And, and I know, I don't care how good you were, pious and religious, you had to have a conscience that I could die before God. I mean, can you imagine the, the pressure on this man as he went in there? Just think about your day to day, just your thoughts. Just think if there's a police car behind you. <laughs> Man. Think about our lives, just regular life. Thank God for his grace. I can't imagine being that priest and knowing tomorrow is the day of atonement. And, you know, I didn't have a fight with my wife because she burnt, you know, I don't know. We just, my child, I didn't. And, and you got to go in the presence of God. Oh, no. For the people. For the people. For yourself and the people. I mean, look, that's what, look, look at the writer of Hebrews, verse 9 at the end that could not make him that did the service perfect right. as pertaining to the conscience. Right. I mean, there was always this whole understanding as, as he ministered that at any moment, God could just strike, strike me down. 
Now, God in his grace, because he gave the ordinance, and more importantly, what the ordinance represented. Every time Aaron or one of his sons or down the course of time, these high priests went and did that service, guess who they were representing in the eyes of God? <coughs> the Lord Jesus. And God had respect. You remember I told you that Aaron and Miriam, his sister, spoke against their brother Moses' Ethiopian wife, Egyptian wife. And what happened was God judged the prophetess Miriam instantly, gave her leprosy seven days. That's the book of Numbers. Why didn't he instantly judge Aaron? You ever wonder that? Because Aaron had the high priestly guard, right? He had the ephod. But do you know that the moment God told Moses to take Aaron up there, tell him to take the priestly garments off, you know that Aaron died and he died. Bam. God had respect for Aaron, first and foremost, because of who he represents, Israel's high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Watch this. Verse 10, it only stood, we had 10 minutes ago, which stood only in meats and drinks. So these are just carnal things. And diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on who? What does it say? On who? Them until the time of Reformation. You know, we were just in Colossians. You know what our Apostle Paul says today? Go there. Let's look at it. It's good. It's better to look at it. All of those things on that law was not for you and me today. It was for Israel. Go, go with me to Colossians chapter number 2. Notice he says it's imposed on them, and even with them, it's for a time, the time reforming the nation, Reformation. Go with me to Colossians chapter number 2. And look what our <coughs> apostle Paul says to us. Colossians chapter 2, and verse number 16. Colossians 2, 16. Let no man therefore judge you. That word judge there, it has, I looked it up, it has, it has an ess essence of intimidation. Like intimidate you or compel you to do something, okay? Religious intimidation. Can I tell you something? Religion will try to intimidate you into doing their legalistic, traditional, denominational rights Amen. and rules and rituals. I they was will, raised that way. That, 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 that's religious thuggery. That's what it is. It's, oh, you better, you know, I gotta tell you, know. And anyone who's been in a denomination or a religion or a cult, something, it uses religion to get you to conform to how they want you to perform. It's called legalism and religion, denominationalism. No, watch this. Or you'll be damned. Okay? Yes, it's, it uses intimidation. If you want to see a beautiful picture of that, Galatians 2, when those men came from Jane from Jerusalem, this is right very early in Paul's ministry. This is uh, after the Jerusalem Council. You see Peter there. He's eating with Gentiles. Barnabas, who's a Jew, eating with the Gentiles, serving the Lord with Paul. Right. And those religious guys came from Jerusalem, from James, to check out the scene and see what's going on. <laughs> and when they got there, Peter, the head apostle of Israel, in prophecy, before the dispensational change, he dissimulated, so did Barnabas, who was the son of consolation. Barnabas was the nicest man, the easiest man to get along with. He was Paul's friend. He went back. He compelled, they compelled those Gentiles to let us do the Jews. And Paul would stood Peter to his face. You just read Galatians 2, yeah. 16 on down. My point is, that's religious intimidation. That's what that verse judge you mean. To intimidate you religiously. Verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat what you eat. Particularly these religious things. <coughs> you know, Catholicism. Oh, it's Lent. What you giving up for Lent? You got to give meat up for Lent. You're not giving meat up for Lent? Oh, you're not a good cat. See? See? See that? Or drink. Oh, you had some, you had some alcohol. Oh, you did not have alcohol. Oh, you didn't want you. See, all these things. All the rules. All the rules to make you right with God. You, you know. That discourages people. It discourages you. It discourages people that are, are told this, the truth of the, of the grace message. Well, as you grow in grace, you're going to stand strong against that. You're going to say, you're going to be like Paul. You're going to say, that's nonsense. But it takes time. It does take time. That's why you have to keep coming. It's called being edified, built up, right? Established in your faith. Right. See, now you can, you can be on, on shaky ground as you learn this, right? And Satan wants to do nothing but get you to, as you're learning the grace message, 
Yes. He wants to get you, and he'll bring some religious intimidation. It's coming. He energized that flesh. He's the God of this world. Now watch this. So you have to grow. What Paul would teach you is all those things, don't let anybody condemn you and judge you on those things. Look what he says. Meet, drink, respect of, and holy day, or it's a holiday as we call it today. New moons, religious calendars, or Sabbath days. Oh, you better keep the Sabbath. Oh, oh no. Which are, so Paul actually tells us what those things pertain to, verse 17, which are a shadow. What's a shadow? A shadow is not the real thing. Right. My, our daughter now, she, 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 she's realizing at three years old, oh, her shadow. She sit there and watch her shadow do things. You know? <laughs> I watch it. I'm like, see there, that's the shadow. That's the law. This is Christ, you know. Paul says that's just a shadow. It looks like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. A shadow of things not gone past to come. To come. See? Prophecy. Paul says those things are yet to be fulfilled, but they're not the issue today, but the body is of Christ. Nice. Go up to verse 10, Colossians 2.10. And ye, that's the body of Christ, are complete Amen. in him. When people say, well, you have to do this to be right with God. I'm already complete in Christ. <coughs> but what about, don't you have to? No, nope, I'm complete in Christ. <coughs> Every time religion comes and says, there's something you have to do to please God. I'm already complete in Christ. See? Yeah. That's the grace that's message. by faith. That's by faith. Well, look at Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Look at Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Start at verse 5. This is beautiful. For though I be absent in the flesh, Paul says, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in who? Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. so walk ye in who? In, in him. <laughs> Rooted and built up where? In him. in him. And established in the faith as ye have been taught. So you got to be taught it. Abounding therein, in that faith, with, grace. with thanksgiving. See, what grace is going to teach you is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can rejoice in Christ. Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. See what Paul's message is? That's not religion. Religion says you have to do it. Grace says it's already been done. Oh gosh, that's... See, it's a shout of things to come. Now let's finish up in Hebrews, and then we'll have our Q&A, but... Go up, we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 9. And then he says a shout of things that were to come. See? See, see how away. subtle that was? A shadow of things. He, Ryan says that the NIV says a shadow of things which were to come. In other words, it's not coming. It's done away with. See see how subtle that is? Just put one word, a shadow of things which were to come. Yea, hath God said. Change the tense. It changed the tense and it changed the doctrine. Now you say, see, we are the people of God and we took all Israel's blessings. The kingdom is not going to come. And No. Possible. Jesus fulfilled the, the law on the cross, and there's no more law to fulfill. Exactly. Right? Isn't that what he said on the cross? What's that? It's finished. It's finished. It's done. What's finished, though? The sacrifice. That the sacrifice is finished. Right. Everything is done. It's all is. Well, what what when he said it is finished, particularly what that pertains to, Jim. That's great. We have it will be ending, but what he's talking about is that sacrifice. What he came to accomplish. It, it, you're right, it's everything, but it, it, it wasn't, everything wasn't over at the cross. There's still the, they still have to play out the rest of the, oh, the yeah. program. But I know what you're saying. But really, like Dorothy said, the, the main issue of it is finished, the finished work of the cross. Everything the was done for us. Exactly. But these, all, hol these holy days that are mentioned in Colossians, that's the stuff in the book of Revelation, the day of atonement, all the yes. tabernacles. So that's why it's a shadow of things to come. To come. It's going to go down in the future. And where you see these things coming is and fulfilled and lay out as Hebrews to Revelation in prophecy. That's the end of the play coming. Great, great. We let's end in verse 10 here. We'll pick up in, in verse 11 next next week. Hebrews 9 verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks. So Paul was talking about that to us. And diverse washings, there's your water baptisms, uh, and carnal ordinances, that's fleshly ordinances, imposed on them Again, that word imposition imposed on them, that's Israel, until the time of Reformation. And the time of Reformation, it, it begins out here with the 70th week of Daniel. 
He's reforming the nation of Israel through chastening, mm -hmm. testing faith. See who would take the mark of the beast or who wrath. would What'd you say? Wrath. The wrath of God. That's all. Yeah, exactly the wrath. And then the time of reformation, the kingdom is established at the second coming of Christ. Uh, if you're listening today and you, and you haven't had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure, and that's the key word, for sure, where you're going to spend eternity? Yes. I love you. These saints love you. By the way, if your religion can't tell you where you're going to spend eternity for sure, it's not worth it. Amen. This whole wait until you get there to maybe find out, or hopefully I get there, or I just can't, no, all that, Paul yeah, doesn't talk about that. You're right. under the law. <laughs> a performance-based acceptance. Right. Our apostle Paul didn't talk like that. No. Our apostle says in Romans 5, verse 8, but God commended, he demonstrated and proved his love in a tangible way in human history toward us, in that while we were yet sinners and ungodly, Christ died for us. The Lord Jesus Christ loved you so much, the Son of God. He died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Now, if you trust him and him alone, what he did on the cross of Calvary and that alone, his shed blood, that's why we need the blood in that verse. Amen. And that blood alone, you have redemption, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He'll forgive you all your sins, past, present, and future sins. He gives you eternal life as a present possession. The gift of God is eternal life. And the gifts and calling of God without repentance, he doesn't take it back. And then he gives you an eternal inheritance in heavenly places. Now, where your works come in, since you want to work, that comes in after salvation. Right. The good works of grace, based upon the message of the Apostle Paul, that's what's going to earn you, as it were, your reward, or lack thereof. A reward is good and bad. He'll reward you for whatever. Well, the works of God's grace is what you need to focus on. That will help you understand those here at, Twin, at Northern California Grace Fellowship. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the word of truth, rightly divided. Father, how wonderful it is that we can even get into a book, uh, the book of Hebrews, written to your uh, people, Abraham's uh, physical seed here in this earth, and uh, even, even for a time to come, even past our present dispensation of grace. But Father, your word is so wonderful, it's so alive and powerful, as we're going to see Amen. in Hebrews uh, where we saw in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is quick and powerful, that we, this little group of people, can study this book of Hebrews, not only understand it, but get wonderful, wonderful understanding out of it and rejoice in it. And, and then, you know what it helps us do? Appreciate your grace to us today in Christ through the Pauline grace message. So, Father, we thank you for the entire word of God right before <coughs> as we take our break and uh, have a little Q&A tonight. We give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.